Thank you.
Okay, uh, listen up guys, it's eight, eight o'clock, it's time to get going. So, several announcements that I'm required to make. First of all, if you're in the back, okay, well, uh, this means he's going to use really to read. Well, uh, in fact, he's a legend from the sun. Cardiology, people in the back, cardiology, forefront. Uh, of course, in Zubesti, and really carefully, Dr. Ray, for her age, was in, in, and to implant uh, angiography that uh, he's the guy who's led the way to be to say without so, uh, trouble. Don't sh all these signs. Uh, for to Neil say that uh, new, and I'm very, very proud of here. I decided to stop doing it in the cath lab. Probably close. I figured it was time to uh, studies that we've done over the years. Critical sense of the field of interview today. Much interventional cardiology, but Angie gave at the Cleveland Clinic, and he accidentally performed the first coronary angiogram. He was doing an aortic root shot, the catheter inadvertently or unbeknownst to him at the time was in the right coronary artery, and he injected 30 cc's of dye, high pressure, got the most beautiful coronary angiogram you'll ever want to see. The patient had, was asystolic for a few minutes, resuscitated. Most people would have said, man, I got away with murder. Soans was smart enough to realize that you can do co selective coronary angiography, and that began an incredible uh, era that we're, we're still in. Ten years later, Melvin Judkins, working in California, felt that the catheters that Soans were using, usually from the arm, and they were tapered and stiff catheters, could be better designed, and he designed some preformed catheters that could be inserted in the bigger femoral artery in the leg, and that really opened uh, angiography to, to many people. We still use these same shape catheters today, 50 years later. Probably one of the most brilliant people uh, in interventional cardiology was uh, Charles Dada. And in 1964, he did the first transluminal angioplasty and presented the concept of remodeling an artery. And this was his first case. This is a femoral artery. And what he used was progressively larger catheters to sequentially dilate the artery. And at the end of this procedure, this artery was more widely patent. Now, I will tell you that Dodder's concepts were pretty much rejected and ignored in the United States for 15 years. But they weren't ignored in uh, Europe and uh, radiologists like Zeitler and uh, others picked up on this, and in fact, Andreas Grunzig learned under uh, Zeitler uh, at that uh, time. And I'll tell you a story. I was at the VA hospital in the early 70s, and we were doing cases through the Soans technique, and you insert a catheter and you flip it into or near the coronary artery, and then in those days, you rotated the patient. You didn't rotate the uh, cine. And I took a picture, left coronary artery, and there was a, it looked like a 90%. And I rotated the patient, and when I turned on the fluoro, my Soane's catheter had slipped into the, left, into the coronary artery, into the left anterior descending, and it was resting near the apex of the LAD. And I was so frightened. I pulled that catheter out, waited a few minutes, the patient was still alive, I thought I had done something terrible and gotten away with it. Subsequent pictures, we could not find any blockage of that magnitude, it was 30, 40 percent. Now what I had inadvertently done was a daughter in the coronary artery, maybe the first ever done, inadvertent, but it shows the difference between genius like daughter and a journeyman like me, I was just happy that I didn't kill the patient. But it's just a, a story. But the real uh, person behind coronary intervention was Andreas Grunzig. And in uh, 1974, he performed angioplasty using a balloon catheter, not sequential catheters, in peripheral vessels. He was a handsome, very uh, talented guy. 
And uh, three years later, he did the first human balloon angioplasty, coronary balloon angioplasty. And this was performed in uh, San Francisco at St. Mary's Hospital with Richard Myla, one of the real forefathers of uh, coronary intervention. And it was done during an operative, operative uh, bypass. He then went back home in September of that year, performed the first PTCA in the coronary artery in the cath lab. And this is the patient. He is alive today. He's had angiograms every 10 years since that time, and those, that artery has remained open. And several months later in November, he uh, presented four cases at the American Heart Association. And it was uh, acclaimed, not wildly so, but it was acclaimed as a very interesting approach. People thought this was a little silly to think you could dilate arteries. Dr. Grunzig's concept was uh, that dilating plaque was like footprints in the snow. You compress the plaque, and that was really uh, the approach. A catheter is inserted, uh, wire first, and then the the stenosis, the plaque. And that was a very simple-minded concept, but uh, it got people interested in that possibility. It's not well known, but I think that as big as his accomplishment with coronary angiography was his accomplishment in operation. Uh, but this was the first time that a mass education was put on for a procedure done remotely in a cath lab, closed circuit uh, uh, television. But it was a step forward in education that uh, has uh, continued today, and it's revolutionized education. Well, at this meeting, there were three of us, uh, Bill Winters, John Lewis, and, uh, and I. And it's a little hard for you to see, so I had to blow it up. But this is a 1979 version of John Lewis, Bill Winters, and myself, and hardly changed. Well, 1985 was a disastrous year uh, for the, uh, really, the grandfathers of interventional cardiology. Uh, Grunzig, Dotter, Judkins, and Soans each died. Uh, Grunzig was a youngster. Uh, he died in an airplane crash. He just bought an airplane and flown it uh, back to Atlanta in pretty nasty weather, got lost, and, and crashed the, the plane. Dotter, Judkins, and Soans died of natural causes, but it's uh, really bizarre that all four of these uh, died in the, same, in the same year. But life went on. And this was the first uh, catheter that we had. And if you go up to the cath lab now, you'll see, picture, you'll see a model of this on the wall. And it was uh, a double lumen catheter. One lumen filled the balloon to inflate the balloon. Another lumen was used to inject dye or to measure pressures. Grunzig was obsessed with measuring pressures as a measure of how effective your dilatation was. And here's an example of that. With the balloon across, here's a pressure in the catheter, in the, gui in the coronary guiding catheter. Here's a pressure in this balloon beyond the stenosis. The balloon's inflated and then deflated, and when deflated, what you would like to have seen is uh, equalization or near equalization of uh, pressures. And this was our approach at that time, and it was a pretty meticulous approach. You kept inflating and deflating, and you never quite knew when you would reach the, you know, the end of what you're able to, to do. And we uh, started doing this, and in fact, in that first year, we did 35. It didn't seem like, doesn't seem like a lot now, but it sure seemed like a lot then. And we presented this at the Houston Cardiology Society. Uh, in the United States, places like ours were doing as many as Grunzig was doing in, uh, Euro had done in Europe, and that prompted Dr. Grunzig to move to the United States and, and do his work here. But we, pre we presented this data, and we thought uh, we were very proud of it. This is one of the first cases. Here's this stenosis 
in the uh, right coronary artery after balloon dilatation. It looked much improved. The RAO view, m mild improvement. We would have called this at that time a successful case. And we were successful in about two-thirds of the cases, and we were quite proud of it. Now we'd be thrown off the staff if our success rate was 65% uh, uh, or so. But we had no deaths. And the reason we had no deaths is because we had fabulous surgical backup, and I do want to uh, single out one guy who was just the most gentlemanly and helped us immensely, and that's George, George Noon. And George, with a smile, would take these dying patients that we'd run into the cath lab uh, and, uh, and, and, and basically save, save them. So we had good re results, but they were good results because our catastrophes were, were overcome by good surgeons. We had fabulous nurses and techs. Shown here are those that were here in the 80s and are still working at Methodist Hospital. There are several here. Please stand up and... <laughs> Phyllis, Colleen, and, uh, and Kathy, and uh, many others, and if they're not when we needed them. A few of what I consider the major milestones in interventional cardiology. And I will go through each of these, but these were steps fairly monumental steps forward uh, at the time. First, intracoronary uh, over-the-wire uh, guide wires. You saw the catheter that I had shown. If you dilated the artery, pulled it back, and the artery closed down, trying to get back was like getting back with a uh, ramrod. It just wasn't very manipulable. So Simpson, John Simpson in 82, came up with an idea of using a wire, instead of measuring pressures, use that lumen to pass a wire. You pass a wire through the lesion, and then you could insert catheters, you could pull them back, you could insert more, you could do other uh, devices. And this really gave birth to the industry of coronary intervention. To show you how uh, monumental that was, for the first several years, coronary intervention uh, was few and far between. And in the United States, it was pretty dormant, limited to a few centers and a few patients. With the introduction of the steerable wires, each year subsequently, the rate of uh, doing procedures doubled. The safety was improved and uh, it became something that was uh, capable, that was in the hands of many, many people. But it also allowed uh, another step, and that is intracoronary imaging. Now remember that these are angiograms, all we could see are luminal, luminograms. But in 1985, Warren Grunfast, dur in, during surgery, did uh, the first angioscopy. They would flush the coronary and using a lighted scope, uh, visibly look at the coronary artery. Richard Spears did this in the cath lab, and this was more an interesting technique than a useful technique. One of the observations was that many of the patients that were operated on for unstable angina had clots in the coronary arteries in addition to severe uh, stenosis. So it was a first step, but the biggest step was intravascular ultrasound with Paul Yock, John Hodson, Steve Nissen, and this was a catheter-based approach that didn't require anything special other than these unique catheters. And it taught us a couple of things. One, and most importantly, it taught us that we were misjudging severity of stenosis. Here's left, here's left main, mid-LAD, distal LAD, big lumen in the left main. What looks like a pretty good lumen in the LAD has at least a moderate stenosis, <clears throat> and more distally, a more severe stenosis. This is all plaque. So we learned that angiography was not the bottom line of uh, coronary artery disease. But another thing we learned later on when we were working with stents is that often our stents were not fully deployed. This was shown easily by ultrasound, where you see the struts, you see space, and uh, 
uh, ultimately, uh, Dr. Colombo uh, taught us that you have to re-expand these to fill the uh, to fill the the lumen. Then intracoronary Doppler came along, and I uh, mentioned that where possible, I would show contributions that docs at Methodist made. Craig Hartley worked here. Uh, he was a genius of miniaturizing technology. And he put a Doppler catheter, usually a pretty big device, on the head of a Sones catheter. And we use that to measure coronary flow, coronary flow velocity, as early as 1974. But the clinical application of this uh, required more current uh, 15 or 16 years later. <coughs> Uh, to look at flow in the coronary arteries, to study hyperemia, where something like adenosine was injected and the flow increased, and there was an acceptable ratio, at least two to one and usually higher, in a non-obstructed artery. Less than that usually meant uh, plaque buildup. And this kind of uh, <coughs> led to a technique which is common today and useful, and that's fractional flow reserve. You have a catheter, guiding catheter in the coronary artery approximately, and then the uh, device that's past the area of stenosis. And initially, you don't see much of a uh, gradient, but when you inject adenosine and induce hyperemia, the distal pressure drops if the stenosis inhibits that, uh, that flow. And here's a case of what looks like a tight stenosis, but with hyperemia, there's no difference in pressure. Here's another stenosis, doesn't look very much different, but there's a big drop. And this is a significant lesion. This is one that de demands intervention. This is one that would not demand intervention. So those are milestones with intracoronary imaging. Now, one thing that kind of popped up along the way was restenosis. And believe me, it was not thought of uh, initially. We had no idea what happens when you did these things in coronary arteries. But we all began seeing things like this. This is a very tight LAD lesion. This is a very, very nice result after uh, balloon angioplasty, PTCA. And this is three months later. The artery for the entire length, even worse than we began, was restenosed. And in fact, restenosis was not only pesty, but it was an incredibly bothersome problem because we would see it in uh, 25 to 35% of cases. And at the time that intervention was expanding worldwide, uh, data in just 2002 were looked at for restenosis rates then, and it was estimated that there were 350,000 procedures performed for restenosis alone at a cost of $4 billion. It was an industry in and of itself. So I mentioned that now, and I will get back to that in, in a little while. But because of restenosis, other attempts were made to do things to plaques. And one of those is what was called plaque modification. If you could erode plaque and had less plaque burden, maybe restenosis can be reduced. And this led to the development of atherectomy devices. The first of which was the same John, John Simpson that came up with this uh, guide wire uh, uh, concept. And he came up with a device that had a little metal cage with a side open, a window, and a little mobile guillotine inside. A balloon would push that window into the plaque. You'd turn on the guillotine, and it would slice that plaque. And this was the kind of plaque that you could recover from large, bulky lesions. And it was felt that this might reduce restenosis, and there was some suggestion of that in the caveat one trial, and it almost was significant, although the numbers were still quite bothersome. Two other trials showed no significance, and then one, the Bow trial, did show a significant uh, benefit to it. But bear in mind, restenosis rates of 40 down to 31 in this 
at trial is still no great accomplishment. <clears throat> the idea of using laser then came about. Uh, Bella first did that in 1985, but the most useful approach was by Frank Litvak, who came up with this uh, with cool laser, uh, uh, eczema laser, and we were very much involved in this particular uh, device. And here in the leg, it debulked and nice result. This is one of our cases with a problematic osteal stenosis with a lot of calcium, and the laser was very helpful in, in opening this. The problem with the laser is that the uh, laser aimed straight and arteries curved and perforations were not uncommon, dissections were not uncommon, and sometimes a very simple lesion became complicated and we uh, jokingly use the term like a laser-induced complex angioplasty for even simple lesions. But here's the big accomplishment. In 1989, Nadim Zaka invented the rotoblada. He based this on a device that you may be familiar with, the uh, Dremel. And, and Nadim's idea was that if you had a device that rotated very rapidly with some filings on the surface of it, you could file down the lesion. It was a much more brilliant concept than cutting away at it. And with different size devices, potentially you could uh, upsize and accomplish much more. Now, uh, D David Roth, uh, who Nadim went to visit with, was not aware of coronary artery disease at the time, but, Dr. Z but he had some expertise that Dr. Zaka tried to tap into. And they got into a bit of a patent fight as Auth very quickly filed a uh, patent application. Dr. Zaka was, uh, after negotiations, given the right to perform the first rotational atherectomy in humans. And this is the first one. This is a femoral artery, and uh, this is a case that he and I worked on. Uh, I was more the watcher than the doer, and here's the device, and here's the improvement. Now, it wasn't a big improvement, but this was done not so much to see how much you could accomplish. This was done during a surgical procedure, and the idea was to collect the blood distal to this rotational device to see if the particles were too big. If they were too big, they get stuck in the microcirculation. Turns out that these particles were under 10 microns, a uh, huge uh, recognition that could safely then be used in coronary arteries. This was that patient who had a big non-healing ulcer, and ultimately that healed. And then there was some great interest in rotational atherectomy um, with the roster trial which showed that restenosis, target lesion revascularization with the rotational atherectomy was about half of what it was uh, with plain old balloon angioplasty. So this was a wonderful accomplishment that we can credit Dr. Zaka. And people came from all over the world to visit uh, Dr. Zaka. And here's the uh, king and queen of uh, Spain with uh, Nadim Zaka in the middle. There's Bill Butler and Carlos Valbona. And uh, one of our surgeons whose name I, uh, I can't remember. But at any rate, it was a big accomplishment. Now, here's the pay. Here's, here's the pay. Auth went on to commercialize uh, the device technologies then uh, sold to Boston Scientific did get to do the first case. <laughs> okay. Well, it turns out that uh, gentle to rotational atherectomy put put it to bed a uh, significant difference. Unfortunately, there was more restenosis with rotational atherectomy as a treatment due to some uh, pre procedures. Uh, at least intellectually, so to conventional therapy and reducing re-stenosis. These stents came about. Well, man, uh, this is George Rogers, one of our... Uh,
uh, Steve Miner, and there with the gentleman who you, Caesar, was uh, the head of interventional radiation. Caesar had invented a stenosis. And we heard about this. We were in the arteries, uh, and we had a pig lab. Gian Turco, he said that a month ago, uh, hired a fellow, Gary Rubin, to come over from Austria on it. And it probably at the same time, biliary uh, tract use was working on uh, in the coronary arteries. After one month, one month in a pig is like six months, in, uh, and you could see a glistening layer of neo into healed metal in the artery was different than humans. Uh, patients, here's the strut and here's the thick neo intima that uh, ultimately sent in a coronary artery, showing that even though the struts are unimpeded. Uh, believe it or not, was performed by Dotter in 1969. And this was this fellowship he a uh, cardiologist, a very fine cardiologist, also was the first. He uh, did the first coronary stent in a vein graft using a self of being there to see these first several cases. And it was quite to get this bulky device in. But at the end of the procedure, the artery looked cases. At the same time, the uh, G and Turco then were going through animal studies for use in abrupt closure. In four to six months, it had gone from 10% to 40% in our lab. So things that work catch on very, very quickly. And, and uh, you'll see that for the rest of uh, your lives. So we've uh, interfered with restenosis, and the stents seem to be a help. But if you look at the restenosis rates with stents, they were still pretty high. So here's a slide of restenosis rates with all the pharmacology, balloon, atherectomy, and stents averaging multiple trials. And while there had been a trend over two decades towards a reduction, i.e. with stents, there had been no clinically meaningful. 25% restenosis is, is, is really no uh, phenomenal ac accomplishment. Instant restenosis was a bigger issue, and trying to open up instant lesions with drugs, another balloon, atherectomy devices, or even stents were dismal uh, failures. And at that time, uh, we thought that the problem of restenosis was the number one problem in interventional cardiology uh, with the um, Colleagues in the cath lab, we studied, along with Rob Schwartz up in uh, Mayo, the process of restenosis. And there really were three aspects of it. One is early recoil, you dilate the balloon, you deflate it, and there's some rubberiness to the lesion. Then you get this reaction of neointimal formation or smooth muscle cell proliferation. And then late, there's vasoconstriction. The artery actually scars down. Now, the reason stents were helpful is that they affect and prevent early elastic recoil. You dilate it, and the thing's rigid. You can't get late vasoconstriction because that thing is rigid. But it does nothing to inhibit neointimal formation. And neointimal formation is really the, the big mama in this uh, process. There have been many, many attempts, and we were involved <coughs> in many of these, looking at the mechanisms of restenosis, uh, thrombus, inflammation, elucidation of growth factors, stimulating smooth muscle cells to proliferate, then migrate to the intima, and matrix cements it in. And this was the process. So technologies aimed at inhibiting thrombus, inhibiting inflammation, growth factors, inhibiting proliferation and migration were all attempted. And for 10 years, innumerable studies uh, uh, and clinical trials, many of which we, uh, we were involved in, 
failed to reduce restenosis. It was pretty disappointing. And I will tell you, I was at a meeting uh, at Boston Scientific, and one of the things we started to discuss was restenosis. And I think, I know I felt that this was probably an insurmountable problem. The response to injury had been around for 400 million years. Uh, any injury gets a reaction, and this was just the arteries reaction. Nature showed that this had to be done. So somebody said to me, uh, Reisner, you've, your group has done a lot of work on restenosis. How do you think we're going to solve this problem? I, what I really thought was that we weren't. But I said, well, we have to attack the cell cycle. I could tell you I had no idea what the cell cycle was at the time. I worked on <laughs> people, animals, and big arteries, never worked on cells. But I remembered that there was a cycle in, in the cell. Well, it turns out that when uh, we and others went back and thought about it, there is a way to interrupt the cell cycle. The uh, uh, oncologists have been dealing with it for years, and that's with radiation biology. It breaks up the DNA. DNA prevents this cycle from continuing. The cycle is very sensitive, and that's how cancer is treated with radiotherapy. Well, there was a company in town called Omnitron that made afterloaders for brachytherapy for, for cancer work. It was used, brachytherapy, you bring a catheter to the cancer. And it was used for localized uh, uh, colon cancers, for lung cancers. So we contacted this company, and we thought maybe uh, we could work with them in developing something that could be used in coronary arteries. And, and they were fabulous at coming up with miniaturization of uh, this device. But we used Iridium-192, which is a gamma source. Gamma penetrates everything. You just can't block it. And we could never get approval to do animal studies in our lab. We had a lab at the Baylor building because we couldn't assure people above and below that the radiation wouldn't uh, hit them. So after six months of trying to get approval, uh, I don't know who came up with the idea. I don't think it was me. But we rented a cath lab. We drove the cath lab out to Louisiana where this company had a big farm, and that's where they were doing some of their development work. We plopped the cath lab down in the middle of nowhere where there was nobody to complain about radiation. <laughs> and we brought out a slew of pigs. Daryl Schultz <laughs> can remember that very well. And here's uh, Nadir Ali and Wojtek Mazur. Wojtek uh, was a uh, uh, tech at the time, ultimately went through residency and is now a, a physician. And we did a bunch of animals out there, then we loaded them back and brought them to their grazing uh, uh, near uh, San Marcos. And here's Daryl. This is not the lab we had, I guarantee. This is the lab we have now. And lo and behold, what we saw was absolutely remarkable. This is an artery after stent injury, and we would really blow up that stent. And this is an artery after balloon injury, and we would really tear up that artery. But six months later, this is what we typically saw. But when we radiated those arteries, in this case, Iridium-192, this is what we saw. We had never seen anything like that. And uh, to us, this was sort of an incredible awakening. And it also was to colleagues at uh, Columbia and uh, uh, Ron Waxman at Emory. And all three of us got very heavily involved in this uh, technology. But this clearly was to be an answer to restenosis. And this is our trial to prevent, but a variety of trials uh, came about, and all of them showed remarkable reduction. This is percent reduction in restenosis. Remarkable compared to what we had uh, previously seen. This led to pivotal trials. Our trial was the inhibit trial, but all the trials, gamma-1, start. The inhibit trial used phosphorus-32, which was a beta source, which was just lead apron uh, uh, blocked that. In fact, nothing 
it just penetrated hardly anything. That was one of the problems with it. But in each of these trials, there was dramatic reduction in restenosis with radiation. And it was clear then that breaking the cell cycle by interrupting DNA worked. But there are some very smart people who realized that there are other ways of doing it. Sirolimus was obtained from soil in uh, uh, Easter Island out in the Pacific, was used as rapamune for uh, prevention of uh, rejection, but uh, they came up with the idea of putting it on a stent. Paclitaxel also used in, in uh, oncology, they came up with the idea of putting it on a stent. And the two uh, uh, paramount trials with Sirolimus, the, the cipher stent, paclitaxel with the taxis stent, showed similar benefit. And this became a much easier approach than brachytherapy, where you had to bring in a, the oncologist, you had extra technology. Here's a stent that you were working with that now had chemical on it. So this basically put brachytherapy out of business, but it, at the same time, it expanded uh, our ability to treat patients without worrying about restenosis. And it evolved, and virtually every subgroup of patients that drug-eluting stents were used on uh, showed benefit in reducing restenosis. Well, let's go to the uh, topic of catheter-based treatment of acute myocardial infarction. And on the left is sort of my time on, uh, in, in medicine from residency fellowship all the way up to now, just to give you an idea of how far we've come with treatment of myocardial infarction. Coronary care units were the big advance in 63. And in, in my residency and fellowship, this was it. But we used to treat the patients with uh, three weeks of bed rest. In 1912, Herrick came up with the name coronary thrombosis based on some autopsy studies. And that was the prevailing thought. But Bill Roberts, in 1972, uh, through pathologic studies, concluded that thrombosis was the consequence of myocardial, and not the cause of myocardial infarction. And this sort of uh, uh, put us in a, a sleeping pattern for eight or 10 years until Marcus DeWood did some angiograms on patients with acute myocardial infarction. And if the angiogram was done within hours, almost all the patients, over 90%, had clot. 24 hours later, when, if the angiogram was done on another patient, only about 60% of those patients had clot. So he then changed the paradigm that thrombosis caused the infarct, and sometimes this resolved. Well, it didn't take long to figure out that if it resolved naturally in some patients, that uh, maybe it could be forcibly resolved. And Peter Rentrope was the first to uh, achieve this acute myocardial infarction, intracoronary streptokinase. Uh, he found that many of these arteries opened, and what he commented on is that ejection fraction improved in those patients. These are patients whose arteries opened, and these did not. The ejection fraction improved when it opened and got worse when it did not. We were also very interested in this and did the AMIRS trial, uh, strepto, uh, streptokinase, compared it to nitroglycerin, and we found that with the streptokinase patients, this was intracoronary streptokinase given in the cath lab, uh, we got an opening of 72%, and this is an example of one case. And I will tell you, uh, this was hard to judge, recanalization, because there are levels of recanalization. Sometimes it's a trickle, sometimes it's wide open. And it was a problem, but nonetheless, uh, it was a problem that anyone involved with it at the time uh, dealt with. But soon after the NIH got into the act, and the first TIMI trial, there are now some 50, uh, were begun. Uh, Chief of Cardiology was instrumental in uh, the design of this trial. Craig Pratt, Mario Verani, myself, and uh, Neil Kleinman were very much involved 
uh, in this and subsequent uh, Timmy trials. And one of the first things that uh, we presented is the fact that the gr we had to come up with a grading system that was superior to just looking at it and saying it's open or it's not open. And so we designed the grading system, which ultimately became the Timmy grading system. Zero, no perfusion. One, a trace of perfusion. Two, some perfusion, but slower than comparable vessels. And three, full perfusion and equal to comparable vessels. And this ultimately became probably one of the most durable features of the initial Timmy uh, trial. And using these Timmy uh, grades, TPA grade one and two in the red, grade uh, three and four in the orange, the percent of patients opening was significantly higher with TPA, and if you compare it to streptokinase, it was double that of streptokinase. And that was really the introduction of TPA to the clinical realm. Then, again, the next step is, well, if you could open it with uh, thrombolytics, maybe you could open it with catheters. Hartzler, was the first to do this, and he was able to achieve a success in 93%. We uh, did a comparable uh, trial, probably a similar time frame, and showed that we were able to open it uh, in 42%, but if we used it in, I'm sorry, in uh, almost 90%, and not much higher if you used thrombolytic and uh, PTCA, but the complications were greater if you use the combination. But one of our observations was that there was a pretty impressive improvement in ejection fraction in those patients treated with uh, balloon angioplasty. And here's a change in ejection fraction from immediate to uh, usually uh, uh, a month later, uh, as opposed to streptokinase, which hardly did anything. So this was an important advance at the time. A lot of trials came about. Randomization of many, many trials showed that PTCA was clearly superior to lysis alone in uh, acute myocardial infarction. Um, we still wound up with problems, thrombosis, restenosis, and a host of subsequent trials were aimed at adjunctive therapy in myocardial infarction. Now, I'm sorry, this was, uh, this was stents, the PAMI stent. And the stent alone, remember the other slide was angioplasty, stent alone uh, did better than angioplasty alone. So stents became the treatment. And then the great interest in adjunctive treatment to improve the safety, maybe improve long-term outcomes as well. Many trials initiated. Uh, Neil Kleiman was a leader, probably one of the handfuls of the prime investigators of, uh, of the, not only GP2B3A, but in multiple uh, antithrombotic agents. And this became standard fare in uh, myocardial in, in treatment of uh, patients with coronary artery disease. Well, this is John Lewis. John's favorite statement was, what's the bottom line? What have we accomplished? So these are data of mortality rates from 1900-1996. And you could see that it, it built up, built up until 1950s or so, and then it declined. Coronary heart disease is shown here. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, yes, the statins and all these medications, beta blockers, came into uh, use at that time, and there was a turnaround. Well, I got news for you. This is, came in 1964, and the Surgeon General came, but it reduced smoking. Seven, angioplasty in 1970, and statins didn't come around. Well, I read now the reasons for the improvement, the conclusions, and it was enough to give 
thousand less than they were 20 years. Reduction was important, uh, almost another 51 percent. The from stable uh, angina, moving uh, life in. Uh, well, it's gratifying to look at the monumental moments in two of those things that I think we need to keep our eyes stand so high. There's inflammation that leads to a lot of problems. There's delayed. There's neoatherosclerosis. These patients, but stents are not for long-term follow-up. There is a progressive loss of stents here. Uh, we probably would say this is highly successful, but is this the best that we could achieve? Also, the issue of late stent thrombosis is a real concern. Uh, Drug-eluting stents that uh, seems to continue to rise, not a high percentage, but enough to get our attention. Maybe better with current uh, coatings, but nonetheless, something that we're all familiar with and all concerned with. It affects surgery because these patients are kept on dual antiplatelet for almost forever. And another issue is something that Neil and I and uh, Howard Rubin and everybody here that's done intervention finds um, unfortunate, but we all have these. And this is a patient of mine who little by little over 20 some odd years got one stent after another after another. And this patient has stents throughout his LAD, uh, a ramus branch and a circumflex branch. So what is, and, and this was not done by one crazy cardiologist all at once. This was done by one crazy cardiologist in multiple uh, pr procedures. So you see the new lesion, you say, what am I going to do? Operate on it for that one lesion, so you put another stent or two. And this is how this goes. But it makes future interventions or bypass potentially more difficult as you get distally in those arteries. So what is bioabsorbable scaffold? They're not stents, they're scaffolds. There are three things that they're supposed to do. Revascularize their stent. Then they partially dissolve, but the function of the artery presumably is restored, and I'll show you some data to that effect. Then, after it's completely resorbed, you have basically a healthy artery, presumably. And this was a very important study looking at vasomotion. And what it showed is that proximal to uh, the scaffold, the artery constricted, this is zero, this is constriction, this is dilated, constricted with acetylcholine, dilated with nitroglycerin, the same distal to the scaffold, but after healing of the scaffold, the same thing was seen. In other words, vasomotion was now back in the artery, potentially a big uh, plus for biodissolvable stents. The race was on, the race is on. There are about 20 companies trying to develop the perfect bioabsorbable stent. The Absorb uh, 3 was uh, one of the first randomized uh, multi center trials. Uh, our Alpes Shaw was a site PI here, one of the biggest contributors to these trials. And what this trial showed was something that's called. Uh, uh, non-inferiority. There was no difference between the stent and the scaffold. Scaffold certainly was not worse, certainly was not better, but non-inferiority. And based on non-inferiority, it was just as good as this was approved by the FDA. But again, from many years of experience, if something is non-inferior, it's got to do something to make you want to use it. And the something is it's got to be easier to use or cheaper or safer. Is it easier to use? Well, clearly not this stage in development. They're thicker struts. Uh, the studies were done with pr pristine lesions. If you overexpand them, they fracture their plastic. Uh, are they cheaper? Well, the current uh, asking price for is $1,500 versus eleven to $1,300 for drug-eluting stents. Are they safer? Well, uh, this, this past month, the uh, Absorb 2 trial came out and showed, yes, there was differences between the bioabsorbable and the stent. The problem was that in this trial, virtually all of these endpoints, 
thrombosis, uh, restenosis, late lumen loss was worse on the bioabsorbable stent. Even vasomotion, now this is something that boggles my mind. How does a stent allow vasomotion? But there was no significant difference between the two in terms of measurements of vasomotion. Patrick Cerise said it was not what we were expecting, it was not what anybody was hoping for, and there is room for improvement. And I will say that every new technology starts with great enthusiasm, then you come up with a lot of data, that pendulum swings, sometimes in the opposite direction, more data comes about, and you come up with a realistic use as you come up with better and better uh, techniques. So I think there's a great future in bioresorbable stents. Finally, I want to just briefly mention something that's been dear to my heart, and that's the idea of a vulnerable plaque. I may have some. It's probably why it's dear to my heart. But this is a patient, a cath, years ago, who had diffuse disease in his anterior descending and this other branch, which I think is a circumflex or marginal, uh, looked pretty darn good. And three months later, and, and we couldn't treat this, three months later this guy had a myocardial infarction, autopsy showed this, and here was a, a plaque that ruptured, here's the rupture, here's the clot underneath the plaque, pushed it up, occluded the artery, and we felt for sure that this must have come from here. But the pathologist said it didn't. It came from this portion of the coronary artery. We would have never guessed that to be the case. Yes, there is some lesion here, but certainly not severe stenosis. And this is vulnerable plaque. Well, studies looking at myocardial infarction in which a cath was done prior to the myocardial infarction showed that those lesions that ultimately infarcted most of them were non-critical, less than 50%. Vulnerable plaque. The recognition of the vulnerable plaque really is the holy grail. The holy grail, if this can be resolved, then we have made monumental steps. One fabulous study by Stone and colleagues, we were not involved in this study, did caths on patients with myocardial infarction, but then they did ultrasound on all the other arteries. And they labeled the different lesions and then they restudied these patients many, many years later. And what they found with a mean follow-up of three and a half years with thin cap fibroatheromas that there was a significant difference in the uh, adverse event rate. If you had a, one of these lesions previously, if you had one of these lesions and there was a small minimum lumen area, it was even worse. And if there was a big plaque burden at that site, it was worse. And if you had all three, it was almost 20% chance of your infarcting within three and a half years. Well, that's great natural history, but we're not going to go put uh, stents into 100 people to prevent infarction 20. And the question is, how are you going to treat this systemic therapy or local intervention? There's a lot of things available for systemic therapy, but I will also say that there are many things available if this proves to be treatable with local therapy. And the truth is that medications have not prevented these events. We've all seen them after MI and after intervention. And when you look at those lesions that cause infarct, most of them are pretty proximal. This is lesion distance from the origin of the anterior descending. So they're within the reach of most interventional procedures. There's almost nothing, even though I showed this slight rise in late events, uh, for the most part, stents stabilize these lesions. So stents are pretty effective in stabilizing if you could identify those plaques. There are many uh, methods that have been proposed. They're all being looked at and investigated. I won't go through all of these, but uh, last year Valentin Frista came out with this comment that vulnerable plaque is a myth. And to prevent MIs with vulnerable, treating vulnerable plaques is a myth. 
And I didn't have a chance to discuss this with Dr. Fuster, but I can tell you that in the course of my career, uh, dilating plaques in the arteries seemed to be a myth. You ask any surgeon how dilatable, that was a myth that was proven incorrect. Um, the ability to put stents in arteries with, to put metal in arteries and not have correct. And they solve for the most part. These myths are only challenged that in, we will have our hands on, we have to learn. We must be able to cats in every artery. And this may be achieved cells or other biomarkers, able to identify it and localize it, in, a grip on it non-invasively, the treatment modalities waiting in the cardiologist. For it, uh, also, uh, it's an incredible trip. Uh, uh, I got off the train in September, but the train is still running with uh, uh, great colleagues like uh, Neil and Alpesh and Howard and, and uh, many others. Uh, and there are many, many accomplishments yet to be achieved. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks, Al. That those of you who look carefully at the fascinating, if you looked at the stents, types, uh, Dr. Reisner was talking about, it's like you've got... Uh, Alan, one thing that's not technology to this cardiologist, and he demanded the program from the get-go. One of the first with two cardiologists had uh, a tremendous oversight, and I think that it, that is something and was moved over to other programs with that, along with the technology, all working independently, and which would make the, that's the comment I want to make for this hospital. Yeah, thank you, for but. The reason is that we really have been talented. Uh, uh, it's really been an hour for everybody. Interest quality was another all of our uh, docs. Thank you. That was great.